It's kind of sad to see how far Marvel has fallen. Where we once had heroes with imperfections, yet inspirational ideals, we now have a slew of idiots, Mary Sues, and a tarnished, possibly irreparable legacy. With phases 4 and 5 being disasters, with the latest installments being a failure, ignored, or forgotten, Marvel has decided to bet it all on the greatest superhero ever to break a man's wrist and steal his possessions. Captain Marvel. There's no way this could fail, right? An executive probably thought. It made over a billion dollars. So she will get a sequel just as successful and the people will like it, or else we'll call them every phobic istinism we can make up. So after multiple delays, reshoots, an almost lethal dose of copium, and tens of millions in additional costs, Captain Marvel 2 is finally here. The Marvels opens with the latest lame villain Dar Ben on a moon without a suit, because the vacuum of space means nothing to anyone in the series. She finds the matching bangle to Miss Marvels and uses it to open jump points, the warp holes everyone abuses like a Super Mario speed run to travel across the universe, and at about the same time, Nick Fury on what resembles the Justice League satellite calls Carol Danvers, and she investigates the moon and jump point that didn't close for some unknown reason. Meanwhile, Monica Rambeau spacewalks like George Clooney in Gravity to investigate another jump point that didn't close for some unknown reason. When the two of them touch their separate jump points, because we can't get away from stupid people touching shit they shouldn't be, their powers become entangled with Kamala's bangle and they switch places with each other. This leads into the three ladies fighting and teleporting with Kree soldiers back and forth with them. After the fight, Nick Babysitter Fury and Monica Champlu meet up with Kamala and her family and conclude what we already have. Meanwhile, Carol heads for the Skrull refuge world of Tarnax, where negotiations between the Skrull and Kree are taking place. During the conversation, Kamala shows off her abilities, switching her and Carol, who after after an awkward reunion with Monica, tries to fly off, but is then switched again with Kamala, who begins to fall from the sky. And this is genuine dialogue from the movie. Here you go. Uh -oh. Monica, you gotta fly. No, no, no. I Magic. Three writers, everyone. Please, try to tell me again how writers today are not a serious problem for movies. Anyway, Monica tries to save Kamala, but they're both switched with Carol, who was on Tarnax. They're caught by guards when, literal seconds later, Carol arrives and starts fighting. This ruins the negotiations, so Darby opens a jump point to take the atmosphere from Tarnax. The trio and handful of scrolls now left escape. The remaining scrolls are fewer than the surviving rebels at the end of The Last Jedi and are taken presumably presumably back to Earth, by Valkyrie. The three morons then connect with each other by talking and training to coordinate their entanglement. Kamala also shows off her bracelet, and Carol recognizes it as one of the legendary Nega Bands. Nega what? Yes. Nega Band. N-E-G-A. Now stop looking at me like I'm Mr. Crocker. Afterwards, they preempt Darby Barbie to the ocean planet Aladna, and we're forced to endure a 10-minute song and dance routine because the people of Aladna communicate by singing. Yep. A planetary threat is imminent, and the film slams the brakes so it can be the Marvel equivalent of Hamilton. Thankfully, it ends abruptly, because the prince is bilingual, so we never needed to endure it in the first place. Great. Wasted time aside, Double Bubble arrives, makes a jump point to steal the water, and the Trace Retardos fail to stop her. A short while later, Darben arrives in orbit around our sun and prepares to transport it through a jump point. Then the group meets up on Saber, and the movie again slams the brakes to to a false threat of evacuating everyone off the satellite so Goose and her children can swallow everyone for ease of transportation back to Earth. The three amigos then go to fight Dar Ben. It's badly choreographed, Kamala is pinned down, and she's forced to give up her bangle instead of switching places with Monica, who can phase through the floor. All right. Anyway, Dar Bendy's nuts then jumps out into space, activates the negabands, is obliterated, and then rips open an unstable rift between dimensions. It is at this point that Foxy Cleopatra reads the script and concludes she can absorb the full power of the Negabands and Captain Marvel, and then use that power to close the rift, but only from the other side. How? Well, what else can it be besides... Black Girl Magic! So now that she's second only in power to God himself, she flies through the rift and closes it before Carol can reach her. The film then concludes with Kamala's family being moved into the Louisiana home. Kamala meets up with Kate Bishop in a direct ripoff of the forming a team scene from Iron Man. And Monica wakes up in the other universe with an alternate version of her mom and Hank from X-Men.
All right, now that I've saved you 20 bucks, let's get into the characters, starting with Carol. She's changed quite a bit between this and her first outing. She's way more relaxed, like she got a hold of some space weed. She doesn't walk around or act like she had a horrible pogo accident with a broom. When she does raise her voice at the inexperienced Kamala, she apologizes as she was stressed from combat and the trio hadn't worked out not using their powers to interrupt each other in a crisis. She also feels guilty about what she's done and carries that chip on her shoulder trying to make amends. Overall, her personality and some of the writing is an improvement. Here's how they fuck that up. She's now infinitely more stupid. The Skrulls hosted the Kree for peace talks, which were going pretty well until Carol decided to start fighting the Kree, resulting in Darben siphoning the atmosphere with her jump points. The whole reason Carol is caught up in this teleporting nonsense is because the jump point was a pretty color and she just had to touch it. The Kree homeworld is nearly ruined because she thought sending the Kree back to the Stone Age by destroying the Supreme Intelligence and crashing everyone's holdings of space Bitcoin would save them. Instead, it drove them to a planetary civil war. And these are only some examples. Oh, and not that it really matters anymore, but the film triples down on her being the strongest Avenger by an astronomical unit. Remember how Thor tried to tank a sun and nearly died from the tan that he got? Well, Carol can now fly into a dying star, somehow restart the nuclear fusion within, and leave without a hair out of place. Recall how she flew at light speed at the end of her movie? Well, she traveled from Earth to Tarn in a matter of seconds. Allow me to math this out. According to Marvel, Tardax is in the Andromeda system, 2.5 million light years from Earth. Now, if we seriously highball the time it took for her to reach Tarnax at 30 seconds, Carol would have traveled at almost 2.7 trillion times the speed of light. I would love to hear someone try to defend how she couldn't reach Monica in time before the rift closed. Now, I don't know much about Monica Shampoo because I didn't finish WandaVision, so I'll be fair and stick to her presentation in the movie. She's bullshit. She's intelligent enough to put Stephen Hawking to shame when the plot needs her to be. She makes conclusions with almost zero understanding of what is happening. Oh no, the Capri Sun shut off. Carol, did you know you could fly into the sun, reactivate it, and save the Cree people? I don't know why no one else thought of that. It was so rudimentary. This is the same shit Marvel pulled when Shuri, who has never created anything anywhere near as advanced as Vision, told Stark and Banner how they could have built him better. And her reasons for being angry with Carol are so petty. She resents Carol for never coming back when she was young when her mom died, despite knowing Carol was in space fighting villains, saving planets, and never telling her in the first place that she was angry. Yeah, so much for being the mature one. She's just impudent. And if that wasn't enough, she's literally invincible. She learns to fly without much effort, can phase through matter, and absorb the full blast of Carol and Kamala's abilities to close the tear in space-time. How Monica concludes that she can do all these feats, I will never understand, because... Black Girl Magic! Now, Miss Marvel, like Secret Invasion, I avoided, because at the time I was preparing my brain cells for, and then had to recover from, Wakanda Forever, and its villain, Cuckoo Kachu, who's weak against air fryers. From from what little the movie gives, Kamala's hard light abilities seem to come from the bangle, though I'm confident it doesn't answer how she has a degree of super strength and durability, like when she tanks a strike from Darben's hammer. But again, I could be wrong. She's also a Captain Marvel super fan, which makes her interactions with Carol annoying when that levy breaks. When she gets her moments to wig out, you want to cock your shovel and take a swing for the fences, similar to when Peter Parker won't shut up during his ADHD scenes. During downtime on Carol's ship, she's constantly yapping about team names, call signs, and other irrelevant things, leaving me to hope she be jettisoned into space like the alien queen. This also tells me she didn't mature much in her own series, since she only calmed down at the end of this film. And despite all of that, I ended up defending her. She's young and naive, so she tries to help out when the situations get out of hand, even if it gets her yelled at, which threw me off. She reminds me of Miles Morales, a young innocent who aspires to do great things like the heroes she looks up to, but when faced with reality, it's a bit overwhelming. When the atmosphere is being taken from Tarnax, Kamala is trying to save everyone that she can, but Carol tells her to stop so they can only save who they can save. 
fuck you, Karen, you're the reason this is happening in the first place, and yelling at this kid who's trying isn't going to make the situation any better. She's a bit of a mixed bag that I don't really care for, but the writers did get some things right. The same cannot be said about Nick Flubby. Samuel Jackson is a great actor, sure, but he's 74, so trying to get him to do anything physically is difficult when the visual effects department has to remove the walker. This is probably why he sits in most of his scenes. When he does join in the chaotic fight scene early on, he can't even shoot a target five feet in front of him, and when he does, he hits the window that separates them from space <laughs> with alien technology. And Tessa Thompson is less exciting than drying paint, so when she appeared, I knew this was the moment in the film I could look away and take notes. At least I would have if her cameo wasn't shorter than a bathroom break. The moment in the trailer you see is the one moment she's in the film, and Carol, who's had approximately five seconds of shared screen time with Valkyrie is now her BFF and here to do two things. She takes the few remaining scrolls, presumably back to Earth, and she gives Carol encouragement with zero context. Lastly, we have Darben, the Kuvira of the Kree who wants to reunify her people after Hala went to shit faster than YouTube post buyout. As she tries to broker trade deals and a peace treaty with the Skrulls, even willing to work with them to find a new home. For a brief moment, I believed her thought process might make sense. But then I realized, wait a minute, this is Marvel. They'll mess this up in no time. Her plan is to return the three main resources to Hala and save the Kree. Breathable air, water, and the sun. To do this, she'll transfer these resources using the jump points she can create with the other Nega Band. But the peace deal was my first clue. If the Kree despise the Skrulls, viewing them as allies to the Annihilator, Carol, then why offer them a peace deal in the first place? They have no real means to defend themselves, and are so few they couldn't fill out a sports ball roster. Why not? And follow me here. Just take the atmosphere. Aladna makes a lot more sense, since there is a civilization to defend itself, so you might not want to fight them. But again, who is going to stop you from just opening a jump point and stealing the water? And why would you announce your arrival? Furthermore, what makes you think the sun would fit through a jump point barely big enough to fit Oprah? The movie wants me to believe Dumbbell is this great unifier, but can't make up its mind as to whether or not she's cunning or lucky. What I can confirm is she's an all-around idiot. Now, as as you know, the gimmick of this film is the three main women's powers are entangled like Jada Pinkett Smith fucking her son's friends. Any time more than one of them uses their powers at the same time, at least until they're detangled at the end, they switch places. Now you're probably thinking, that's a cool idea in theory. How do they mess it up? All the time. Brain power is a scarce resource at Marvel, so for this mechanic to be thought up by them is like a barbarian having an idea. Some examples. At one point, Monica and Carol fly out of a tower together, and they don't immediately switch places. Same thing happens during the final fight when Kamala is using her powers to make platforms while Carol is blasting away. But no switches occur. If the inconsistencies weren't enough, I've got as many unanswered questions here as I did my SATs. Why did Monica need to be on the other side of the rift when she could have done the same from her side? If Monica needs a suit to survive in space, why isn't she a corpse like Desmond the Moon Bear after switching places with Carol on the moon? For that matter, why can Monica breathe in space later when she couldn't earlier? Why does the entanglement with Kamala's bangle not affect Darben as well? Why did the destruction of the Supreme Intelligence on Hala caused their son to collapse. If the jump point on Aladna wasn't stopped and continued to transfer water to Hala, doesn't that mean Aladna is basically a giant desert now? Ah yes, don't think, just consume, how could I forget? The problems don't end there, as corporate media and every shill that lets Disney and Marvel use them as public toilets have predictably tipped their fedoras and come to the defense of the Marvels. Racists hate strong people of color. Weird, I don't remember anyone hating characters like Blade, Storm, T'Challa, Miles Morales, Wong, Gamora, Nick Fury, Falcon, Shang-Chi, or anyone else that isn't white. Men hate this movie because they're misogynists. That's funny. According to this article, 65% of the people who went to see the Marvels were men, meaning women failed to support a movie targeting them. Not like we haven't seen this in recent years with Charlie's Angels, The 355, and Terminator Dark 
fate. This movie didn't receive any promotion because of the SAG-AFTRA strike. Then why didn't that stop Matthew Lillard, Josh Hutchinson, and others from promoting Five Nights at Freddy's while the strike was still going on? I wonder why they weren't stopped from advertising that financially successful movie that gave fans what they wanted. But remember everyone, the Marvel's incredible and historic failure couldn't possibly have anything to do with awful writing, Stupid characters, stilted acting, rubbery CGI, bad pacing, choppy editing, inconsistent rules, shit direction, behind-the-scenes drama, forced ideology, and continual degradation of a once-successful brand. Nope, all the failings are exclusively the fault of white men and fans who make up the majority of the audience that saw this trash pile in the first place, lest its box office performance be about 65% lower than it currently is. All hail the MCU. May it rest in piss. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.